This segment of our course deals with the removal of bearings from a very common type of pump now at use at many plants throughout the country. This is a single stage centrifugal pump, very similar to many pumps at your plant. The bearings we will be removing are inside this bearing housing. There are three separate bearings. Two angular contact ball bearings mounted in duplex and one single row radial bearing. You'll see exactly what we're talking about in just a couple of minutes. First, we will need to assemble the required tools, equipment, and supplies for the job. Then put on the safety equipment for the job, as required by your plant. The actual disassembly of the pump is not important to our job. Therefore, we will not cover it in detail. On this particular pump, it's necessary to dismantle the head, impeller, case, mechanical seal, and gland before you begin work on the bearings. Once the pump has been taken apart, you're ready to begin. Our first step will be to clean the outside of the bearing housing thoroughly. This is done to prevent any dirt from getting into the bearings as we take them out. Actually, this cleaning could have been done before the workman began to take his pump apart. Our next step will be to drain the lubricating oil from the bearing housing into a clean container. We use a clean container because we will want to take a close look at the oil that is being drained. If it is dirty or has metal flakes in it, then there is a good possibility that the bearing is damaged or worn. After you check the condition of the oil, Remove the coupling from the shaft, taking care not to damage the center in the shaft. Now remove the outboard deflector from the shaft. As you can see, there is no deflector mounted on the inboard end of the bearing housing. The outboard deflector is designed to prevent dirt, moisture, and the product the pump is handling from leaking into the bearing housing along the shaft. Remember, though, that all pumps may not be equipped with deflectors, even though the model we're showing you is so equipped. The workman may now remove the cap screws from the bearing cover. And the bearing cover itself from the bearing housing. Be sure to save the old gasket. You'll need it as reference in obtaining a new gasket. Now remove the shaft, with the bearings on it, from the bearing housing. Once it has been removed, inspect the bearings very closely. As we mentioned earlier, the condition of the lubricating oil is a good indication of your bearings condition. If the oil was clean, the bearings may sometimes be reused. However, you should check them very carefully for roughness before you do so. This may be done by rolling them very carefully like this. You'll be able to feel roughness that you could not see with the naked eye. If the lubricating oil was dirty, chances are that the bearings are worn or damaged. In that case, replace the bearings and do not attempt to reuse them. We will assume that the bearings on this shaft are worn and cannot be reused. Our next step will be to remove them from the shaft. To do so, clamp the shaft in a vise like this. It is often wise to use a vise with protective jaws to prevent damage to the shaft. Now unlock the lock washer from the lock nut by bending this tab back out of the slot. Then remove both the lock nut and lock washer from the shaft and inspect them carefully. In many cases, they should be replaced along with the bearings.
since they're subject to damage from a number of sources. To remove the first bearing, the single row radial bearing, we remove the shaft from the vise and place it in an arbor press, like this. The parallel bars should be positioned so they will support the inner race, not the outer race. Now place a piece of buffer material, such as this piece of copper, over the end of the shaft. It is used to protect the shaft center from damage during our next step. It's then a simple task to press the bearing off in one smooth, continuous motion. The other two bearings, the two angular contact thrust bearings, are pressed off simultaneously. Again, position the parallel bars under the inner race of the bottom bearing, like this. Then, since these bearings are in a duplex mounting, we press both of them off the shaft at the same time. Pay very close attention to the way the bearings are mounted and check them against the manufacturer's drawings. For instance, these bearings are mounted back to back. Remember, though, that this may vary from one piece of equipment to another, depending on how the bearings are mounted. Once you have removed the bearings, Record the bearing identification on a piece of paper. You'll need this identification when you order replacement bearings. The workman is also ordering a new lock nut and lock washer in this particular case, since the old ones were somewhat battered. Although the actual removal of the old bearings is now complete, it is necessary to prepare the bearing fits for the replacement bearings. First, mount the shaft between centers in a lathe and polish it carefully for inspection purposes. Be very careful not to remove any metal during the polishing, as we do not want to change any tolerances. Now measure the shaft bearing fits with an outside micrometer to ensure that they meet specifications as set forth by your plant. What we mean is that the manufacturer will have certain requirements with regard to bearing installation. They must be installed with an interference fit, not any looser than a certain limit or any tighter than the other limit. These will be the maximum or minimum interference fits as dictated by the manufacturer. Your instructor will explain what your plant policy is on where you will work within the limitations set forth by the manufacturer. Once that is done, check the shaft for radial runout with a dial indicator. Then check the shaft shoulder for squareness. It is very important that these shoulders are square. If they are not, the bearing will not seat firmly against it, and you will have problems. The workman is now checking to be sure the shoulders are true. Next, inspect the bearing fit in the bearing housing to be sure that it is not worn or damaged. Measure the fit to be sure it meets the manufacturer's specifications. In other words, the manufacturer of the bearing you will be installing says that the inside diameter of this housing must be a certain size to accommodate his bearing. You have to make sure that you meet his specifications. Again, if you don't, you're asking for trouble. As you did with the shaft, check the shoulder in the bearing housing for squareness. This is very important to the correct and efficient operation of the bearing. Once you've established that all of your fits are all right, clean the inside of the bearing housing thoroughly and dry it carefully. You are now ready for the installation of the new bearings. Remember that we are dealing with a specific pump in this training module. And even though it is a very common type, 
you will encounter other models on the job. This means that your procedure will vary somewhat from what we are showing you here now. However, if you understand what we are showing you, you'll find that you will encounter little difficulty with other bearing removals. We have some questions for you now in exercise number three of your workbook. This segment of our course deals with inspection of bearings and causes of failure. Or, how to keep your bearings longer. It's very important that you learn to recognize the causes behind bearing failure, so that the cause can also be repaired or otherwise remedied. It will do no good to continuously replace bearings if you do not correct the cause or reason for their failure. During the next few minutes, we'll show you pictures of bearings that have failed and the damage that was done to them. We will also explain the basic reasons that caused their failure. It would be impossible for you to learn to recognize all of the types of bearing failure after one short presentation, like this one. However, it will acquaint you with some basic points to look for. All of the bearing failure pictures we will show you are included in this bearing manual along with a detailed explanation of what caused the failure. Ask your instructor for your copy. Two very human categories for the failure of bearings are incorrect handling and incorrect maintenance. Now, this covers a broad field of problems, the majority of which are based on carelessness, impatience, or inexperience while installing or removing bearings. This is an example of what we mean. The inner race of this bearing was damaged by impact. Another type of damage which you can inadvertently cause is by hitting the bearing with a hammer or wrench. This will result in brunelling. However, this can also happen as shown here. The small indentations inside the outer race are caused by the machine vibrating while the bearing was not turning. The balls are harder than the race and cause the dents you see. Electrical damage is another category of bearing failure. The electricity is static or stray currents that pass through the bearing during its operation. This picture shows electric pitting on the surface of a spherical bearing outer raceway. You can also see pits in the spherical roller itself due to the passage of that current. However, all electrical damage does not cause pitting. The fluting on the inner raceway of this cylindrical roller bearing was caused by the passage of electric current over a long period of time. You can imagine how rough this bearing was running by the time it was removed. The improper installation of bearings is often a major category of bearing failure. Again, the reason is human. The fits must be measured very closely with special attention to the specifications set forth by the bearing manufacturer. A bearing can be damaged very badly if its fit on the shaft is too tight. In other words, a bearing must have an interference fit on the shaft, but only within limits. Here is what happened when this bearing was mounted on a shaft with an excessive interference fit. You can see the axial crack that ruined the bearing. Here is another inner race that has been cracked. This was caused by fretting due to yield in the shaft journal. On the other hand, a loose fit of the bearing on the shaft or in the housing can also cause a wide variety of problems. This outer raceway, as shown on the top, is a result of advanced wear and cracking due to fretting corrosion. The view at the bottom shows the top race as broken at the crack. Here is another example of cracks caused by a loose fit of the bearing in a housing. 
What you see is the cup of a tapered roller bearing. The outside is badly worn, and there are cracks running around the inside circumference. Our next category of bearing failure is faulty lubrication. This title covers a wide area, since it can mean too much lubrication, not enough lubrication, the wrong kind, or even contaminants such as water or acid in the lube. Faulty lubrication usually results in overheating and damage to the bearing. Here is an extreme example of what can happen. The cage on this high-speed bearing is broken in several places due to inadequate lubrication. This inner race shows another result of inadequate lubrication. This is called spalling, where chunks of metal are torn out of the bearing. This is an example of inefficient lubrication. This is called skid smearing. It is caused by a piece of metal being torn out of one of the races by the ball or roller and pushed along the surface of the race. The result is a skid smear. Contaminants in the lubricant are also a major cause of failure. These bearings and inner races are the result of advanced abrasive wear due to contaminated oil. Another form of contamination is presence of acids in the lubricant. This results in corrosion of the surface of the bearing, like this. A common problem everyone has encountered at one time or another is shown here. The end of this roller is rusted due to moisture in the lubricant. In short, follow good lubrication practices and your bearings will last longer. This means enough lubricant, but not too much. The lubricant should also be the right type, and it should be clean and free of contaminants. Faulty lubrication is a major cause of bearing failure. The final category of bearing failure that we will show you is material fatigue. This is often the result of the other causes we have already outlined. Here is the inner race of a ball bearing with an advanced form of fatigue called spalling. As you can see, a chunk of the inner race has broken away. An even more advanced state of spalling is shown in this picture. As you can see, stresses on the edge of the bearing caused overload and material fatigue. The bearing was completely ruined as a result. You've now seen a variety of bearing failures due to several basic causes. Learn to recognize the symptoms as soon as you can. Then apply this knowledge to correct the cause of the failure. Once you can do this, you will have become more than just a bearing changer. We have some questions for you now in exercise number four of your workbook.